You're watching the Conservative Talks brought to you by the ECR Party, your weekly Q&A show on the deeper themes driving the European news cycle. I'm your host, Jorge gonzalez Galarza. Every week, an expert roster of authors, lawmakers, and newsmakers will join me to unpack the events rocking the European Union's foundations in a short, digestible format from a conservative and Euro-realist angle. Well, welcome to another episode of our series today. We are so delighted to visit with uh, John O'Sullivan, who is a, who is a friend of um, conservatives across the old world and, and really worldwide. And, and uh, John, is, as our audience will be aware, is now president of the Danube Institute. He's uh, currently tuning in from his, uh, his second home in, in, in the American Deep South. And we're, we're so uh, grateful that he's making time for us, given the time difference. Uh, but John, really, I think, uh, you know, folks know you, your distinguished career, through the decades, um, you know, across media, but also think tanks on both sides of the, the Atlantic, but also worldwide, really working with folks from all different kinds of uh, national backgrounds and, and even persuasions. Um, so you, I think you bring uh, such a unique perspective on to, to some of the issues that we hear discussed in terms of uh, where we're at uh, in Europe uh, and some of the conversations we, we want to have. I, I think a helpful way perhaps also to introduce you to our audience is I think you distinguish yourself also as a cold warrior uh, you uh, you um, became of age politically at a time when, uh, you know, I, I remember you saying at one, uh, one point you um, uh, believe in the, the 50s, you, you were really mad at Budapest and what happened uh, with, uh, with, the, with the tanks there. And um, obviously you, uh, you served in, in policy roles with, uh, with Prime Minister Thatcher, but also uh, then emigrated to the States and were editor-in-chief of, of the National, Re of National Review, the conservative, I think the conservative magazine for a lot of people. So um, you bring this, this very unique perspective to your current role as well. You're, you're president of the Danube Institute, one of the more uh, interesting uh, institutions in, in Hungarian democracy at this point. And, um, and I, I thought we could perhaps maybe start right there and have you uh, share some of the um, interesting projects that the, the Institute, the Danube Institute has taken on lately. You've been uh, president at a time, at a very delicate time for Hungary's um, even self-image, I think, in, in a lot of ways, and um, and uh, I would love to hear maybe uh, some of the projects that you're you've been taking on. You've uh, we've witnessed some of the nasty campaigns, um, you know, in the in 2015 with the migration crisis, but also recently with the COVID-19 situation. And your the Danny Vincent should really is a is a is a is a is a is, is an institution that that uh, connects uh, Central Europe to uh, the Anglosphere and to the rest of the world. So hopefully you can share with us maybe uh, some of the big projects that you're, um, that you're taking on at the moment and some of the things you're excited to do. Well, for the same reasons that everyone else uh, has suffered from, namely the restrictions on movement and uh, because of the pandemic, uh, COVID-19, uh, some of our regular programming has had to be set aside. Um, we haven't had large conferences because people can't come to them. Uh, even seminars and so on, they can't come to. So we've had to migrate more to um, uh, to, pro to to this kind of of conversation, namely um, uh, podcasts uh, with distinguished people from different areas of life. And so we invented first the lockdown dialogues, and they have become the Danube dialogues. And we've been talking to people all over the world, um, in the United States particularly, in Britain also. Um, but also we've had programs from Paris and, uh, and we're going to do more of this. Uh, this now going to be the, the, the Danube Dialogue will become a regular um, twice weekly, basically, um, program going out. And uh, we think take that very seriously. Now we think also uh, that we will return as we're assuming it will be something like April um, to regular programming. And, uh, we have a number of projects in our minds and already embarked upon. For example, we're looking at a program on, well, we used to say political correctness, uh, but cancel culture is now the phrase. And we have a program that is, I think, going to be very impressive. Uh, Richard Le Goodco will be talking about the theory and practice of uh, political correctness. And then we'll have a number of people who've been uh, victims of it or observers of it. Um, we, uh, for example, uh, Charles Cook of National Review, 
uh, just uh, he's just given up the editorship of the National View Online to become a more regular writer. He's found uh, he's found editorial tasks, uh, I think, a bit confining, and he wants to, in a sense, be able to express himself, which is good news because Charlie's work on the French elections last time was exceptionally good. Now, um, so he's one of the speakers, but so also is Kevin Myers from Ireland, who was a famous victim of political correctness, accused of anti-Semitism, and that might have sunk him. Had the uh, Irish Jew uh, uh, Jewish community in Ireland not um, rallied to him very strongly, pointing out that he'd been one of their strongest defenders, and so he'll be there too. Um, I think um, I've mentioned three, we, we could go on, but the point is that, oh, Douglas Murray, of course, our old friend, um, um, who's, um, I think, always good value on this topic, particularly so, he'll be taking part. Now, Douglas, coincidentally, is somebody, for an example of um, our uh, visitors program. I have to say, I felt a bit sorry for Douglas because he arrived, so to speak, just as the more severe lockdowns were being imposed. And I was afraid we were going to find that he had to sit at home twiddling his thumbs in, the, in his apartment. But in fact, um, I was looking at the interviews he'd given, where he'd spoken and so on, um, and he had done, he'd never stopped working while he was in, in, uh, in Budapest. Now, uh, we've got other uh, people coming to Rod Dreher, for example, the American conservative, and also the man who, so to speak, theorized the Benedict Option. He's going to be one of our guests, a long, long, long stay, I think, for Rod. And, um, and we're very pleased about that because his particular um, brand of conservatism is, is, I think, of growing importance and of growing, growing interest. And also it's one that we want to, in a sense, invite into the Central European Dialogue in order to to in a sense one of the one of the big questions that's going to be discussed I think in the next year or two, given the defeat of the Trump administration and a lot, and a lot of other things is the meaning of conservatives. There are of course several meanings because there are several conservatisms, and I think Rod is going to play a major part in that. And I think the and, and one of the conferences we will be holding probably at this point we have to think in either late summer or more likely early fall is will be a conference on conservatism and so that's um, that that will give you some idea now i think we've also got to look at the successes and the failures of, of the Orban administration i think um, its failures have mainly been imposed by things like the the uh, the covid 19. i mean that's been that's blocked a lot of good things that maybe they've been able to do but i think um we should really um We'll be looking at the, where they've done well, where they've done less well, and I think that's going to be an important part of our, our, um, uh, of our work in, in the summer. But there we are. There are some of the things. Of course, we're a full-service think tank, so we're not just going to be dealing with those. We, we try to we say two things. One is we try to deal with the issues that are important, important to us, but also we obviously think important to you. And secondly, we try to be agile. We try to be quick on our feet. We're a small organization. Um, but what we try to do is to, um, is to see what everybody else um, might be interested in, but somehow no one has picked up on. And we'll, hold a, we'll bring someone over quickly to give a talk and hold a seminar, maybe take part in a debate. And that's um, one of the other areas we're dealing with. Like that will be the Middle East. But I think finally, um, I think we should say that the um, the podcast and now the and now our our magazines. I mean, we have just about to launch, for example, the um, uh, we're just about to launch the Hungarian Conservative. That's we're not strictly the people doing it, but we we have the some um, some involvement in it because I used to be the uh, editor at large. In fact, I still am of the Hungarian Review. Hungarian Review is going to come out four times a year from now on, uh, and the Hungarian Conservative will come out, I think, six, and I'm going to be someone who's helping with that, but that's, that's a, a magazine that's going to be under the editorship of uh, Tamás uh, Magarich, distinguished academic. Um, I think that will give everyone great confidence in the magazine, just as the presence of my colleague, uh, 
uh, Jula Kotlani, as editor of the Hungarian Review, uh, did the, did give gave people a lot of enormous confidence in, in the, man, the quality of the magazine that he produced. And he produced 100 issues uh, before deciding that uh, he wanted a rest. And so he's, like me, become an editor at large. And so um, those things will continue. And my final, um, in a sense, point is that um, we're launching, I think it will be in March, the, um, uh, the Danube Review, which will be uh, a newsletter uh, written by people in the countries of Central and Eastern Europe. Um, about developments, economic, political, social, cultural, in their societies coming out on a, at first at least, I think a monthly basis, but I think later on fortnightly, maybe weekly. And, uh, and that will be um, an electronic uh, magazine, uh, newsletter, and uh, that's under the editorship of Mark Higgy, distinguished uh, Australian uh, and a diplomat. He was the Australian ambassador to Hungary, but also to the EU and to NATO. And he now lives in Hungary for much of the year, and his uh, he's going to be producing that. And I think that that's badly needed because, and I've answered this question. I've given this is a marathon answer, so this really has to be. I have to see the finishing post here. But um, um, Mark. Uh, and the rest of us see the bad press that Hungary gets. Uh, of course, you know, every government does things we don't like at times. And no one will say everything in the garden is lovely in any country, but the attacks in Hungary go way out of line, grotesque exaggerations of any criticisms that are legitimate. And, and they ignore, of course, many of the good aspects um, of, of what's going on here. And uh, so, it will be important, therefore, for this magazine to provide um, an absolutely factual, uh, sensible, um, checkable um, a series of reports about what's going on, not just in Hungary, but in all the countries of Central and Eastern Europe, to provide um, the journalistic community as much as the general public with an accurate and, um, and sensible uh, a series of reports on these countries from a generally conservative point of view, but then most of the stuff that's written is written from a generally left-wing point of view. Yeah, this is this is so fantastic, John. Um, not only is it always a privilege to, to um, get a piece of your mind, but also to get a, a sneak peek, sneak peek of, of some of the great projects that are being uh, taken on in such a uh, an exciting. Uh, community you're building up in Budapest, not just in Danube, but but across the city, and and, um, and getting to hear some of the things that you're looking forward to to doing is a is a real privilege. And um, and I think that your your transition to online world has been uh, picked up as uh, as particularly successful. I think uh, a lot a lot of people worldwide really are enjoying uh, being able to tune in on demand at whatever time of the day, week, month, and being able to to hear you discuss and tackle some of the important issues, even from uh, that are happening in their countries, as you mentioned, France being one example. But um, and I, and I think that uh, that transition to, to online has been uh, has been really successful in in Budapest. Um, but I think um, you know there there's so many things to unpack in what you've said. One of the interesting ones is um, the necessity of connecting folks, bringing perspectives together from different uh, national contexts, and and really trying to build a community at a time when uh, what you traditionally could have been called the right is undergoing some tectonic shifts, right? Uh, uh, undergoing uh, a, a, a depth of change that perhaps we'd never seen, certainly not in the, the uh, decade preceding Donald Trump, as you, as you mentioned, and some of the work you're doing to bring folks onto those conversations from uh, the UK, but the US as well and other parts of Europe are particularly important and, and beneficial. But um, there's also another angle that, that we could go down here in terms of the issue of political correctness, as you've called it, I, I revel hearing you um, still stick to the um, to the uh, to the old uh, old school uh, 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 formulation of the problem, right? It's you know uh, cancel culture. When you you know when you speak of cancel culture, you almost kind of accept that there's a normative basis to be canceled. And political correctness is is, a, is perhaps a term that we should uh, keep using. And and um, um, you know there is. There is obviously the issue in uh, how a government like, oh, like Prime Minister Orban's, but also uh, the government in, in Poland, for instance, how they're uh, 
um, seizing the issue of uh, the um, narrowing of acceptable opinion and the role of big tech platforms in enforcing what is acceptable, seizing on the issue to, um, to, to draw the positive, the positive message. I think you're absolutely hitting the nail on the head when you said that one of the issues is that with, with Hungary is that it needs to be a positive narrative and it needs to shine a, a light in a dark world. And, and seeing how that issue has been used in that way is interesting. So perhaps could you, um, um, could you maybe, um, uh, it, are, are you confident that the work of, of the Danube Institute and your, your partners in, in the city in Budapest, are you confident that it can genuinely provide an alternative to what we're seeing across the liberal West in terms of the narrowing of acceptable opinion, the things that we have to, that we're no longer at liberty to voice. Um, and, and the fact that, you know, these governments are, however um, kind of self-interested the move has been, the fact that they are taking a, a pretty hard stance against that. So are you confident that, that your work can make a difference there? Well, I think, first of all, let me just say one uh, element of change, um, which is important here is in, in our internal organizations, is that we have recently, as you said, moved to a new website. Now, that's still, so to speak, in progress. We always used to say, and uh, it was true, that the we could um, you, you could look at everything we did. We always put everything up on the on the uh, on the screen. And you know, if you want to accuse us of bias, well, go and look at the thing. See if it, your charge is fair or whether we did better than you thought. And um, and we are transferring all of that material. It's taking. It's not going to happen overnight to the. Uh, to the new body, and we'll um, and we're going to, in fact, take a lot of our past material and make it more available in a user-friendly way uh, via the internet. Obviously, um, you will always be able to look at a full conference, uh, but we'll also break it down so that you get um, speeches and experts and excerpts from speeches uh, available, which are particularly newsworthy. Uh, available. So, I mean, that's in a sense our seal of good housekeeping. You know, uh, you may want to think badly of us, but all right, that's fine. But only think badly of us after you've actually looked at the material we produced, and you can find that's just justification. Now, you're quite right to uh, to answer the second half of what you're asking. Namely, um, we're living in a world with an increasing uh, degree of surveillance and rest and restriction. And that is very worrying to people like me. And that's why I, you know, in the last uh, living in America, converted me to being a First Amendment absolutist, really. Um, I now, I never, I wasn't when I arrived, I'd come from a culture of official secrecy in Britain, and which I'd supported. But I now think that I was mistaken. And I actually think that the, uh, the First Amendment is a wonderful um, thing. Now, it's not enough. Uh, you've got to have, it seems to me, not only uh, good uh, legal and constitutional protections for free speech, you've got to have a culture that supports them. Otherwise, you know, you'll get the 1984 situation in which the people in power, in this case, probably the left, but not always, the people in power define um, what free speech is so that it means something that is considerably less than free. And that's something that we have to be wary of. And we have to be wary of that, whether or not it's um, conducted, whether the restraints are placed by government or as you said, uh, by commercial organizations, corporations or whatever, and the, ma and the major tech giants. I think what's happened in the closing stages of the American election, in which newspapers simply refused to print stories that they thought would be damaging to Joe Biden, and the tech giants simply uh, would not would not uh, allow people to exchange those stories and place many other restraints. I think that has made any complaints against the Orban regime look small beer. Now that doesn't mean to say there might not be legitimate uh, complaints, but there's certainly no uh, general restraint on public opinion here. Journalists are not arrested. It's not Erdogan's Turkey or Putin's Russia, and. Um, and there are um, freely, and there are strong uh, anti-government uh, um, editorials and news stories in major newspapers. If you're looking for imbalance, I would say that the government actually may have, uh, does have uh, probably a preponderance of newspapers and mass media on its side. It's also got a preponderance of um, social media against it. 
and and that's a, a sig increasingly significant factor. So um, I think that we've got to look at all these things in all countries and assess um, how we can protect uh, liberty best and, and free speech instead of deciding that free speech is a secondary value. And when somebody says that free speech is secondary uh, and the protect and protection of others from offense and hurt, um, psychological hurt is the main factor. You may be talking to a progressive when he's, who's saying that. You're not talking to a liberal who's saying that because free speech is the ur value for liberals, a fundamental value. Uh, and I think they're correct in that. And um, so I'm, uh, I think that these battles, particularly as you highlighted, the battle on council culture and political correctness, uh, these are going to shape our lives very considerably in the next few years. And we have to be, have to think very carefully. And on my case, it's fairly easy. I've, I've thought a lot about it in the past and I know which side I'm on and it's that of free speech. That's, that's wonderful and, and so fantastic. And um, one of the things that I think will be very benef beneficial to people um, watching you, uh, listening to you, John, is, um, you know, you've, you've, um, you know, you're, 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 you're an old journalistic hand. You've, 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 consulted, written, edited uh, so many different publications over the years in, in so many different countries that uh, you've, you're familiar with uh, what, the roles, what the rules of speech should be. And, uh, and that's the kind of experience that we need to uh, bring forth if we're, if we're going to try to uh, maintain those, those rules that, that, uh, that we, that we um, hold dear. So um, I, I, I think another aspect very interesting aspect of, of what you've said is, and you're, you're increasingly seeing some of this in, in, um, in, on your side of the pond right now, is the necessary alliance with old school liberals, right? People who genuinely from the progressive left have not given up on, on the basic rules of a, of a liberal uh, society. And I think, um, I, I wonder to what extent this ties up into to my next question. I think in, in some ways it does, but I, I do want to get into something that I've found your work at the, at the Danube Institute to really, really um, enlighten, which is the, the issue of memory in, in the countries where you work. You're, you're obviously the Danube Institute is, is, a, is a conveyor belt uh, for, for peoples and ideas um, from, from Central Europe, but uh, to, to connect them to, to the Anglosphere and the rest of the world. And one of the things that really struck me in the sort of the campaign and the rhetoric around so-called democratic backsliding is the irony and the, the, the amnesia of, and the irony of having, um, you know, the, the supranational elites from countries that, have, that are accustomed to liberalism like Germany and France telling, uh, telling their fellow Europeans east of Berlin that they are backsliding towards democracy when they, 30 years ago, knew what real totalitarianism felt like. And I, and I thought, you know, some of the great work that you've engaged in recently around the 1956, um, remember the remembrance of what it, what it felt like for Hungarian society to live uh, in, in, the, in 1956, I, I thought that was profoundly interesting. You mentioned Rod Dreher, and I think a lot of his work draws on this. And I, I think, I mean, what's the sort of the memory angle of your work? Are you trying, um, are you trying to, um, to convey what uh, you see in Budapest as being the sort of the um, the patrimony, the, the, uh, the almost the, the sentimental patrimony of Hungarian society, which is increasingly being put at risk. Because when you do have these supranational liberal elites uh, telling you that, you know, uh, at the end of the day, your real experience of totalitarianism doesn't matter because what matters is that I get to characterize you as an authoritarian. So um, w w can you uh, perhaps uh, expand a little bit on how you see memory piecing into to your work at Danube? Well, of course, uh, it is absolutely vital that, that, that um, people remember, nations remember, the, the formative experiences. If that means they have to remember the things they did wrong, of course, uh, as well as the things they've done right. Um, uh, I think most of us would say that Germany's um, willingness to confront its own past and make sure that, that never, nothing like that ever happens again um, is very, very valuable. Um, it may have some psychological side effects that are a bit um, unfortunate. Um, there is difficult, it seems to me, for uh, Germans to feel um, patriotic in an uncomplicated way. I think we all understand that. But eventually, 
that's a psychological tick or a, a kind of um, a new mild neurosis that has to be overcome. Germans have to feel, uh, be able to feel as much as anyone pride in, in, German, in what Germany has achieved, particularly obviously since year zero, 1947. Uh, so that's one thing. On the other hand, there is a general tendency among the elites to think that any form of uh, love of country, uh, patriotism, um, is, a, 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 is a toxic um, nationalism, more or less akin to um, uh, fascism. Uh, that is foolish and it's wrong. And it produces a distorted view of one's own past. Um, people are constantly exhorted at the moment in campaigns about colonialism and so on to forget the, to, um, to remember uh, the evils of the past. But that past was not entirely composed of evils. And indeed, the moral balance sheet of colonialism is actually a complicated one. Uh, for instance, wherever the, the British Empire expanded, not all empires are the same. The Soviet Empire and the Habsburg Empire are very, very different animals, so to speak. Uh, we must look at empires rather than an abstract imperialism. Uh, because if we look at the history of particular empires, we'll see what genuinely happened and what, and what good and what bad sides it had. But the British Empire meant the end of slavery mm. for countries in Asia and Africa and, uh, and, and, and parts of America. So that, that's a very important element in the history of the world. It meant also the end of piracy. Um, it, it meant um, dedicated people attempting to govern um, the colonies intelligently and, and decently, not at the beginning, as Macaulay said in his um, great essay on Warren Hastings, there was an early period of the uh, expansion of the East India, uh, uh, I'm trying to think, sorry, the East India Company, um, which was um, characterized by rapacity uh, uh, on the part of the, of the company and its employees, um, accentuated by the, the, the fact that they were the most modern people in India at the time. Um, but that was, that was overcome. And eventually, the former Indian Prime Minister, Mamon Singh, could give an address at Oxford a few years ago in which he said that modern India was a, a blend of several cultures, one, one, of them, one of them being, and a very important one, the, um, the British uh, legal and constitutional structure, which has generally served India very well. And it's very hard to govern a country uh, as multifarious and as India. And so um, when, we, when we say we want to remember, it can't just be we want to remember the things which make us feel guilty. That's a bigger distortion as wanting to remember only the things that make us feel proud. And I think that um, the, the problem is that the power of many of the people who govern us today is actually based, uh, rooted in institutions, the very existence of which is hostile, so to speak, to the continuing pride of particular nation states. Uh, the, if you're trying to create, and I think though this is not really acknowledged intelligently uh, by the Eurocrats, if you're trying to create a European people, a European demos, that inevitably makes you want to weaken the pride and the, uh, self and the independence and the sense of self-worth of the nation states that, com that, would, that would be part of that future European demos. I don't think you can build a healthy Europe in that way. I think a healthy Europe has to be rooted in the idea that Europeans are different both individually and nationally. And the best thing to do is to harmonize the independent uh, nation states by arrangements which are loose and which allow individual states and uh, nation and member states to vary, to opt out of particular arrangements and not to think that, um, that they, they are, in a sense, they're the agents of a federal power, mm. a federal power over which there is no real democratic control or in, indeed democratic accountability. It's a myth.
Sure. And it's, it's, um, it's so important and, and really so interesting to see how your own work at Danube pieces into this and, uh, and trying to have a, um, as neutral as possible a conversation on what are some of the, um, on some of the, the, um, the deeply held um, memories and, and some of the national, uh, a sense of national anchoring that people bring onto this new European conversation that we're having as a result, as a result of the supranational project. And, and, um, and we certainly look forward to seeing you tackle that specific issue as well, Danube, and, and, uh, and, and engaging with folks who are, who are, who've already begun working on this and, and, um, and, and really bringing forth perspectives from Central and Eastern Europe that, uh, that are, um, that are, um, um, you know, um, that are sounding the alarm on some of the worrying things that we're seeing with this, this worrying trend towards, um, you know, political correctness and this worrying trend towards uh, 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 sort of a single mode of thought. And, um, and, and, and the experience of Central Europe is, as, as we can see with your work in, at, at the Danube Institute, profoundly relevant to that. So, um, but you're also tuning in from a country that is, it is in the grip of its own, um, of its own experience with this sort of rewriting history zeal so so um so there's so so many different uh, experiences that one can bring to this and if you have any parting thoughts john would, would love to get them but we're uh, nearing sort of the end the end of um the time that we have for today it's been so <laughs> you must interrupt me more often george it's uh, <laughs> no it's, no you do have to um and well um, any part of so well it seems to me the uh, looking at modern europe um it's facing very great problems and it's got to find a way of resolving them. Uh, the, uh, you can take the view, which I don't, that the euro is an absolutely essential element in you know, the development of European unity, unification. I don't take that view because I think that you cannot, it's very hard to have a country um, uh, composed of 27 other countries uh, stretching far north to south and east to west, um, with very different uh, political cultures and histories, and say, right, from now on, um, we're going to have the single currency, although our economies have not converged in the way that experts say they should before you can do that. Now, at that point, either you say, um, we want, uh, we, we accept the logic, we're going to have a single government, a single treasury, a single uh, finance ministry, a single fiscal policy, a single financial policy, in which is, in a sense, the way the elites want to go. Um, um, but if you say that, then you have to say goodbye to independent national sovereignty. And that's not where the voters and the people are. And they, the elites so far have not been prepared to actually ignore and override that. They've done, they've gone quite far in that direction, but they've not been prepared to take that final step because they know how difficult that step would be. And they don't think they, many of them think they would not be able to carry it off. So what follows? Well, what follows from that, it seems to me, is to redesign um, uh, Europe as a kind of, uh, what's those, what are those um, uh, patchwork quilts, a patchwork quilt continent in which um, you allow people to diverge from the common agreements in various ways, not just for limited periods, but maybe forever. I mean, if, the, if let's say the Swedes or the Danes wanted to be out of the euro uh, because their, their currencies would otherwise have to suffer things like the internal devaluations which have devastated the countries of Mediterranean Europe, uh, I would say, let them opt out. In fact, I would say to begin with, let's divide the euro into a northern and a southern euro. And if we do that, many of the problems that at the moment are causing agony in parts of Europe, I, again, I specify uh, Italy, Spain, Greece, and, uh, and, and uh, Portugal, um, I would say it would be a sacrifice well worth making because it's be a sacrifice of um, a powerful idea and vision which turned out not to work well uh, in the interests of 27 countries. I'm, I'm so glad, John, you're, you're finishing on, on, a, on such a Euro realist uh, note, uh, which, is, uh, which is in a way the driving impetus for, the, for this webinar series. And we're, 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 so, we're so thankful that you made time for us at an, uh, in, in, uh, in Alabama, at Al Alabama morning time. So thank you so much. We look forward to visiting with you uh, at some, some point again in the future and uh, see you again at a future episode of this, this okay. series. Very nice seeing you again. Cheers. All the best. Thank you.
That is all the time we have for this episode. If you like what you've watched, stay tuned for future episodes on YouTube and across the ECR Party social media presence. Thank you.